to the Baptist Broadcast. Thank you so much for tuning in through Spotify, iTunes, Podcast Addict. Of course, if you're listening here on YouTube, oh, don't forget about uh, forget about Anchor.fm. That's the host site, but you can also listen to the podcast there. If you're listening here on YouTube or watching here on YouTube, please click that subscribe button for a subscription and the bell for continued notifications. That bell pops up right after you push subscribe. So if you could push subscribe below this screen and then that bell for continued notifications, you will not miss out when we drop new content here on the Baptist broadcast. So if you haven't already, I would encourage you to go back and listen to the episode on what obey the gospel means. It's just the most recent episode before this one. Uh, so so check that out uh, if you haven't already. If you have already checked that out, then this is kind of a follow-up to that. Uh, one of the things that I've, th- that I've found out uh, is that there's not a lot of discussion or maybe there's not a lot of of understanding or at least application of the threefold use of the law in our law gospel discussions. Um, and that's especially true online. And, and, and I, I get it that there's not a whole lot of, uh, uh, of opportunity to be as clear as we need to be online. So, so I got that things are going to slip through the cracks. Things are going to be miscommunicated, misconstrued. I get that. It's just the nature of any sort of digital discourse. Um, so what I would like to do here is talk about the threefold use of the law. Now, a qualification really that I need to make at the outset is that the threefold use of the law is not the same thing as the threefold division of the law. So uh, many of you probably have heard of the threefold division of the law, which is moral, civil, and ceremonial. That is a distinction made in uh, Second London Confession, chapter 19. Uh, we're not talking about that. When we're talking about the threefold use of the law, not the threefold division of the law, but the threefold use of the law, we're talking about the threefold use of the moral law, all right? The threefold use of the moral law. So if you take that threefold division, moral, civil, ceremonial, what law are we talking about? We're talking about the moral law. And now when we're talking about the threefold use, we're talking about the three different ways that moral law can be used or or the three ways in which it applies to sinful man. And those three ways are this, right? Here's the threefold use of the law. Number one, the law is condemnatory, right? We're talking about the moral law. The law is condemnatory. It condemns man, condemns all men everywhere. Um, the, the Second London Confession says that the moral law is... Um, a, a like a universal, uh, a law of universal obedience written on man's heart. This is from the very beginning. And so this moral law condemns all men who are fallen in Adam. Uh, you know, Bobbing says something to the effect of, of as soon as man wakes up to consciousness, he is aware that something is not right. So all men everywhere are aware that they've fallen short of this law, okay? So uh, the wrong response would be to say, and this is what a lot, uh, all people do in their nature, in their sin nature, before uh, before hearing of Christ or being effectually, effectually called to Christ by the Spirit, what all men will do is they'll say, okay, well, I, ne- I just need to be better, right? They'll say, I need to be better. I need to fix what's not right in me. And, uh, and then everything will be hunky-dory and we can go on with our business. Uh, but the reality is, is that when we're talking about this, this first use of the law, we're talking about the law's capacity only to condemn, right? And then what this does secondarily is because it condemns, it shows man the seriousness of his sin. So it kind of prepares a way, uh, not a way, so to speak, but it prepares man to hear the gospel, because the law really takes man to that precipice of hopelessness. There's nothing that I can do to save myself. There's, there's, I'm only condemned. Guilt remains with me. I'm not free of it. It's not going anywhere. 
there's either hopelessness or there's some kind of grace out there. Uh, and of course, that grace is not revealed through nature. So unless a, a, a minister of the gospel comes and preaches the gospel, or unless that person picks up a Bible and reads it, they're not going to know what the gospel is, right? So they're going to be left really with hopelessness. There's nothing that they can do. There's no power in the law. The law only condemns. That's the first use of the law. So we get the first use of the law from places like uh, Galatians 3. Uh, if you look at Galatians 3, 21, you see where Paul says, Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. No, the law is complementary to the promises of God. There's a certain way in which that's the case. We'll get to that when we look at the third use. But what he says is, Certainly not. It's not against the promises of God because if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. And what he's saying there is the law is powerless to give life. All right. And so that that would take us to the first use of the law. The law only condemns. It shows us God's righteous standard. It reveals God's holy character. And it says what we are not. Basically, we are not that. All right. And so we are condemned. There's a sense of guilt that arises as a result and uh, and there's either hopelessness or there's grace. Thankfully, there's grace, but that only comes through <clears throat> uh, special revelation through the scriptures uh, as Christ is revealed therein. What's the second use of the law? So that's the first use of the moral law. What's the second use of the moral law? The second use of the moral law would be a civil use. Uh, it is unquestionable that civil government structures its law and its jurisprudence and so forth upon natural law. This is without dispute. Uh, it, it's an observable reality. Uh, of course, the fact that this culture or that culture or all these cultures in the world do something doesn't vindicate what they do. But one thing that has been observed, uh, you know, interculturally throughout all history is the fact that Man generally has this moral compass. Does he d does he deviate from it? Yes, more often than not. Uh, but all nations, as a rule of thumb, punish things like murder. All right. Now there are aberrations of that rule. There are uh, exceptions to that rule. But generally, when you look at the whole history of the world and all nations and all peoples, there has been punishment for what has been deemed to be evil in society. And this is the impulse that arises from man's sense of natural law. Um, so that would be another use. That would be the second use of the law, that it would be informative uh, of, of civil government. Now, there's the question of whether or not, you know, if you, if, you, if you say, well, the moral law is codified in the Ten Commandments, should the civil government uphold both tables of the law, the, the God laws and the man laws, right? The the first four commandments and the the latter uh, six commandments should should states, should nations governmentally uphold the whole moral law or should it only uphold the um, uh, the second table of the law, which is or which are laws regarding uh, how we treat neighbor and loving neighbor. Um, and I would just say this. If you look at, at chapter 19 of the 1677, 1689, uh, article 2, it says, The same law that was first written in the heart of man continued to be a perfect rule of righteousness after the fall and was delivered by God upon Mount Sinai and Ten Commandments. So it's basically saying the natural law and the Ten Commandments are one and the same. But at, at Mount Sinai, uh, the natural law or the moral law was codified in the form of the Decalogue, in the form of the Ten Commandments, and written in two tables, the four first containing our duty towards God, right? So the first four commandments, our duty towards God, and the other six, our duty to man. So I would just leave you with this thought. Uh, if the confession is correct in that assessment of, of what each table of the Decalogue is for, if the state were to enforce both tables of the law, would it not make the first table of the law an expression of our duty toward man? Because at that point, we would be obeying the first table uh, in order to appease a, uh, a, a, a human civil government at that point. So, you know, that's something to think about. 
It's also something to think about the relation between church and state, not in the interest of necessarily wanting to keep them totally separate as if they have nothing to do with one another, and as if the church has no duty to preach the gospel to uh, to the secular powers. However, um, what about the church's role in church discipline? And should the state be allowed to usurp the church's responsibility to discipline its members? Uh, is there a kind of way in which the church works with the state in disciplining members? In which case you would have something along the lines of Roman Catholicism and how it and how it viewed its relation to the state that the inquisitors, you know, would do no violence to those uh, to those being questioned. Uh, but uh, upon the discovery of heresy, what the church deemed to be heresy, the inquisitor would then hand over the uh, the suspect, uh, which would be found guilty by the inquisitor, would then hand the, the guilty party over to the uh, civil authority, and the civil authority would carry out uh, oftentimes capital punishment as a result of the heresy. And so, uh, you know, I don't think we want an arrangement like that. So, uh, so consider that that fact. I'm not going to go into all that right now. Just some things to think about there. So uh, the second use of the law is is informative of civil government. The debate is had as to what extent are the Ten Commandments brought to bear in civil society. So that's the second use of the law. Debates notwithstanding, the third use of the law is more relevant to the Christian and probably most relevant to uh, those of you listening to this podcast. If you count yourselves professing Christians. And that is this, the law is a pedagogue or a teacher, uh, I, I, I kind of like to describe it as a school that's taught by Christ, all right? So, uh, no longer is the, the moral law, as the confession says, uh, believers are not under the law as a covenant of works, all right? So, the moral law doesn't relate to us, or we don't relate to the moral law as if it's a covenant of works, so we're not... We're not necessarily looking back to the Ten Commandments and thinking of the Ten Commandments as if we were in the Mosaic Covenant, right? We don't want to do that because that covenant has expired with the inauguration of the New Covenant in the blood of Christ. And so we relate to the moral law, which is enshrined in the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. Uh, We relate to the moral law through Jesus Christ and within the context of a different covenant, that is the New Covenant. So uh, the law now is a school... Uh, a school that's revealed by God and taught by Christ uh, that shows Christians how to live the Christian life. It's a rule of our sanctification. It's not a law to be kept unto gospel grace or unto gospel blessing, but a law that is to be kept as a result of gospel grace or as a result of gospel blessing. Um, So, Roughly speaking, that's the three uses of the law. If we could just summarize it, the first use of the law is condemnatory, shows man their sin, um, or shows man his sin. Uh, The second use of the law is civil, and the third use of the law is pedagogical. That is, it teaches believers the right way to live in the light of Christ. I often say that it, it teaches believers what liberty or how liberty in Christ ought to be expressed ethically or morally. Um, And so in that way, it it very much complements the gospel. So we come to the last paragraph of chapter 19, uh, article 7. Neither are the aforementioned uses of the law contrary, which if you read chapter 19, all the uses of the law are there that we just went through. It says, neither are the aforementioned uses of the law contrary to the grace of the gospel, but do sweetly comply with it. The Spirit of Christ subduing and enabling the will of man to do that freely and cheerfully which the will of God revealed in the law requireth to be done. So even there you see a law-gospel distinction. And the law-gospel distinction in Article 7 there is that uh, the law is is not itself the gospel, uh, yet it complies with the gospel. Right, it says neither are the aforementioned uses of the law contrary to the gospel, to the grace of the gospel, but do sweetly comply with it. And implied in, at bare minimum there is is that the law is not not to be identified with the gospel, but it's also not to be seen as repugnant to the gospel. It's to be seen as complementary to the gospel. And so we maintain that law gospel distinction because it's so so very important. If we 
fail to maintain the law gospel distinction with regard to the first use of the law will be giving the law a power that Paul himself in Galatians says it doesn't have. It doesn't have the power to uh, give life. It only has the power to condemn. Uh, we'll be trying to Christianize society with the law, according to the second use, if we confuse law and gospel, uh, according to the second use. If we, if we confuse law and gospel according to the third use, as Christians, we'll be thinking that we are, uh, that we are uh, making God pleased with us in virtue of how we obey. And thus, we'll be thinking of ourselves as those who maintain their justification and ensure their glorification by something that we do. And so we don't want to do that. So it's very important to, throughout all those uses of the law, all three uses, it's very important to make that law gospel distinction. Guys, I hope this was very helpful. I hope it was clarifying. Uh, but if it if it if it caused more questions to be raised than you had before the episode, uh, then maybe that's a good thing as well. So uh, God bless you guys. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.